we have a, a little bit of time together here today. Um, and, and I know, I, I think it was uh, someone named Alubi who just asked about social procurement and, and really that's what we're going to spend the next 10 minutes discussing. Um, just, you know, the responsibility of public procurement in order to actually, uh, facilitate social good and, and what the responsibility is to create a really diverse supplier pool and the impacts that can have on uh, your local community or really a, a global community. Um, and we're going to look at this basically from how you can award your RFPs more equitably. Um, so again, I'm Anthony. I, I won't reintroduce myself or anything. We'll, we'll just go ahead and hop into it. Um, the agenda for today is pretty simple. Uh, we first wanted to spend a little bit about, of time talking about uh, why vendor diversity is so important. Um, and then actually dive into three really key considerations or, or potentially key actions that you could take in order to better facilitate a more diver diverse vendor pool and inherently also a, a more diverse uh, pool of contracted suppliers in, in, in your database. Um, so let's go ahead and hop into the first topic here, which is why is vendor diversity so important? Um, and, and I'll just read the first one off here. So, so you know, uh, procurement departments have a unique opportunity to promote social good. And I think for a lot of the agencies we work with and, and a lot of the agencies all across Canada and the US, I think this was felt especially acutely uh, through COVID where you know a lot of businesses were struggling and government spend happened to some degree in some nature, although as Lorenzo just mentioned to a reduced nature, um, but a lot of these businesses were highly dependent on government spend and government contracts. And the supplier that you actually would award uh, would have a, a huge impact on that organization and inherently also the organizations that weren't awarded as well. Um, so I think it's just become something that a lot of teams have realized the power uh, that procurement wields to basically promote social good and, and be conscious of social good in the way that they make decisions. Um, and I mean, even just to quantify this a bit more for, you know, in, in Canada, the federal government has, of course, a huge amount of purchasing power. Um, spending about 18 to 20 billion dollars per per year on on goods and services. Um, so I, I think government has some responsibility not just to spend that money and of course make a, a fair and transparent purchase, but also make a purchase that is conscious of benefiting society at larger while still providing that economic value as well. Uh, the second point on here is that diverse suppliers can provide more competition, ultimately leading to better value decisions. Um, it, it of course depends on what you're looking to buy or what market you're playing in, but I think in a lot of markets there is more of you know just a few key players who are involved, um, and just being more conscious about identifying suppliers who might have you know might be owned by a minority-owned business or might be a local supplier or a smaller business. Um, getting a variety of different solutions uh, will of course give you the greatest breadth of options to decide you know what what contract or what supplier relationship actually makes the most sense for us to pursue uh, for this specific uh, you know, problem that we're trying to solve. And the last thing here, which is really driving the urgency for a lot of these changes is that the, the fact that policy is changing. Um, in the US, there, there has always been, or not always, but there's been policy around to support uh, participation of MWBE businesses and DBE suppliers uh, for, for a long time. Uh, but in Canada, we're starting to see this as well. Uh, specifically for increasing and supporting participation for uh, Aboriginal or First Nations suppliers. Uh, of course, the government of Yukon introduced its First Nations procurement policy, uh, which incentivizes businesses that are owned or employ First Nations people. Um, but we're seeing the same type of policies roll out through uh, all different types of organizations, K-12, uh, higher education, local municipal. Um, so there's more and more uh, policies that are rolling out to support uh, you know, these type of or incentivize uh, these type of behaviors. So assuming that we're all on a similar page about why, uh, you know, you know, social procurement matters, um, we wanted to dive into really the meat and potatoes of this presentation, which is uh, unpacking ways that we can actually facilitate or encourage, uh, you know, a greater participation of diverse supplier groups and also uh, a greater, of course, award rate to those same type of suppliers. Uh, the first is just to be really conscious about eliminating barriers for disadvantaged businesses. Um, especially in, in, in Canada, I think a lot of organizations are posting opportunities through, uh, you know, a variety of different portals and we're seeing a huge increase in uh, online solutions to do so. Uh, one of the biggest barriers that, that teams are seeing or that we're hearing from vendors is any type of a paywall, right? If I need to pay money to access an opportunity or if I need to pay money in order to 
uh, you know, upload a digital submission. Uh, you're creating a friction point between that supplier and, uh, of course, the buying organization. And whenever money is involved, you're going to be disproportionately affecting, you know, suppliers who, you know, are less established or, or have less money because, you know, 300 bucks to a small local business means a lot more than, of course, 300 bucks to uh, Business Depot or Staples or something like that. Um, beyond just looking at the money side of this, another big thing that we see teams that uh, do that increases friction is having really lengthy or really long registration processes for vendors. Um, so again, just just two really quick wins thinking about how we can make uh, as frictionless of an experience as possible to encourage all different types of suppliers to participate, uh, but also specifically removing barriers that um, disproportionately impact suppliers who might not have the same amount of money as, as really large suppliers. Uh, the second thing that teams can do that to action today to uh, see a successful vendor diversity program is actually start to track this type of information. Uh, of course, what uh, you know what gets ma measured matters. Um, so a lot of teams don't have a lot of sophisticated tools to track, um, you know, of all the vendors that we are engaging with on opportunities, what percentage of those are First Nations or, or Aboriginal owned. Um, of all the contracts that we cut last fiscal year, what percentage of that spend is going to disadvantage suppliers? Um, so again, I think for a lot of these programs, step one is often to kind of dip your toe in the water and just start to try to employ some more of these different types of practices. Uh, sophistication and really intentionality comes from setting benchmarks and setting goals for these type of programs. But of course, it, you know, those benchmarks and goals are fruitless if you don't have a proper way to measure against those goals and benchmarks. Um, so being really conscious and thinking about in order to establish this type of program and to hit these type of benchmarks, what is the process that I have in order to actually capture and, and, and collect, uh, you know, what percentage of our vendors uh, are from a disadvantaged community? And the third thing we have on here is just simply getting your opportunities in, in front of more businesses, right? Um, it's one thing to reduce friction and reduce those hurdles as we talked about on, on point number one. Um, but even more simply, it's just if you can get more eyeballs on your opportunities and put your opportunities in spaces that are different uh, than where you're looking now, that you're just going to be able to increase your chances to find you know, a supplier of a different type of status or a supplier with a different type of uh, approach. Um, from the report that we run, which is the, the state of public sourcing, uh, we have actually seen a huge increase in the number of suppliers that are invited into projects, um, where year over year we're seeing like a 77% increase of vendors who are invited in, whether that's through a direct invite or a pre-qualified list, or whether that's through more automated like commodity code matching. Um, but the reality is being able to tap into a community of vendors uh, at scale through technology is, is becoming more and more important. Again, and that's just going to allow you to I can put those opportunities in, in front of more businesses, uh, which of course is going to translate to more competition in the market, uh, more diverse vendors, more local or small business vendors, and uh, just fresher options beyond tried and true partners uh, to really make sure you're driving the best outcome for your agency. So to summarize, there, there's really three key things or three key actions that I think uh, I'd encourage all of you to, to think about and think about how those could uh, be deployed in your meeting. Uh, the first is understanding what type of frictions or what type of barriers are established that are might be preventing uh, small or disadvantaged suppliers from participating on your opportunities. Think about what type of metrics that you want to capture and how you could actually track against those metrics. And then even just as a more general broad strategy, uh, where are my opportunities living today and what type of tools, methods, or practices can I be using to cast that wider net? Um, just to wrap up on here, we have just one example of, of an organization who does use Bonfire. Uh, so this is Great Lakes Water Authority, who is, uh, you know, a water utility district in the Detroit area, which of course is an area that has uh, been historically uh, under a lot of economic distress. So for Great Lakes, they've been very uh, acutely feeling this pressure to support their local community, uh, and they were specifically able to use Bonfire to build those programs, to track against those programs, and again, just to make sure that we have incentives in place to support. Uh, in this case, the local community to make sure they're supporting Detroit businesses um, for what they're doing. Um, one example, of course, that we see um, again in, in Canada, we're mostly seeing teams start to prioritize and track against Aboriginal and First Nations communities. But uh, I'm curious to get a sense of what what you folks are doing if if this is something that's on your radar and and how you're uh, been interacting with it. Um, I have some things I can plug here from. Uh, from bonfire as well, but maybe I'll, I'll pause for questions for right now. Uh, if anyone has any.
Oh, and Jerome, if you're talking, you're on mute. Thank you. Mute is what we learned during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a couple, uh, couple of questions for you here. Um, so the question is, I don't know if you can read it, so I'm going to read it for everyone. Uh, what innovative solution or processes do you recommend for procurement teams that are under a lot of pressure to save costs and ensure vendor diversity? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Because I think often these two sort of initiatives are, are presented through the lens of an economy, right? It's like, I can only have one or the other. I can only work with diverse suppliers or save money. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, what I would do first and foremost is just start being very intentional about finding these type of suppliers. I'll be very intentional about um, setting what your benchmarks are and, and starting to capture that data. Uh, and I think teams are typically pleasantly surprised about, you know, when it comes down to the, to the nuts and bolts or when it comes down to just the economics of it all, uh, they might not have to make those same type of compromises that they're expecting for the cost savings. So um, from my perspective, I think the first thing to do is to actually start to capture that vendor diversity data um, and then start to see how that data actually translates into you know, the awards that you're, that you're pushing out. Um, of course, for some like things like, let's say, commodities where there are often diminishing returns at a certain degree for what you're buying, like, um, you know, that may or may not present an opportunity for, you know, it might be more difficult to award, award with, a, with a disadvantaged supplier in that instance. Um, but, you know, maybe you're looking at something that's a more complex service uh, where, you know, you can go and actually talk to that specific supplier or do something in that nature that, that might present an opportunity for savings as well. So, and of course, it depends on the project and, and the type of uh, tender or, or RFP that you're running as well. Thanks, Anthony. I see we have a, another question, but we have literally two minutes. So I don't know if you can address it in, in one minute or 30 seconds and maybe do a follow up about the commodity code. So can you speak briefly about commodity code mapping uh, and use in a procurement initiative? Yeah, so uh, commodity code Maybe mapping. Uh, Anthony, and then we can do follow up. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, so briefly, it's just a way for vendors to self categorize themselves against goods and uh, specifically for bonfire. We have an ecosystem of suppliers. Uh, where they all map themselves against those commodity codes. So it just allows teams to tap into that community of users easier. Um, so, if, you know, I'm code four, which is I sell apples and you want to buy apples and you can send out an invite to every single vendor across, uh, you know, let's say Canada who's selling apples and understand what type of supplier status they might have from neighboring organizations. Um, so it's just about creating connection through technology uh, across all other public sector procurement teams as well. <laughs> 